You're welcome to the gavel. I'm Linda Akiwe. The 131st Inter-Parliamentary Union Assembly meeting ended recently in Geneva, Switzerland. It was four days of debates and discussions on issues such as the Ebola outbreak, gender inequality, security and terrorism. IPU member countries canvassed the elimination of violence and harmful practices against women and are seeking for more representation of women in parliaments across the world. Take a look. Achieving gender equality, ending violence against women and addressing the Ebola scourge topped the agenda at the recently concluded 131st Interparliamentary Union Assembly in Geneva, Switzerland. About 744 parliamentarians from 101 countries attended the four-day event. Parliamentarians looked at the growing cases of violence against women, be it sexual, domestic or any other form of abuse. Six out of every ten women are victims of all types of violence. One out of five women are victims of rape. Thirty-five percent of women killed are murdered by their intimate partners. These are just a few of the statistics which was given by the president of the IPU, Abdel Wahad Radi, at the assembly meeting. So what are the immediate strategies parliamentarians are looking at to end violence against women and gender inequality? And how can they protect women and children in wars and conflicts? These are some of the questions the Assembly sought to find answers to. In some national surveys, over 70% of women have experienced physical or sexual violence at least once in their lifetime. We will not be able to effectively confront any of the challenges before us if we do not achieve gender equality. There will be no peace without the full engagement of women. It's as simple as that. This Assembly is holding a miscontinued conflict wars and terrorism in different parts of the world and increasing terrorist activities in Nigeria. Parliamentarians were reminded that as a voice of the people, they must be at the heart of protecting the women and the vulnerable people in the society in the midst of all these conflicts. This is because values and norms are formed early in life. We could design strategies for that. Secondly, it's essential to sensitize the community to embrace change and particularly that there is nothing private about violence. This requires that both the boys and girls, men and women, are encouraged to speak out against violence in the homes, in the clans, schools, tertiary institutions and communities. Disenfranchised individuals and groups, injustice and failed leadership, all of which adds up, adds up to lack of social cohesion which fuels instability and undermines development potential. As institutions, Parliaments represent avenues for inclusion of different voices and platform for accommodation of different points of view. One of the strategies put forward at this meeting to increase the number of female parliamentarians is the introduction of a quota system where specific seats will be kept for women to occupy. But it is one thing to propose a strategy and quite another for countries to adopt such a strategy. People do vote for a particular woman over and above a man who the constituency may consider. Uh, to have better chance of winning and representing them. So that's why I said our election is very competitive. So I, for now, our constitution does not envisage a situation where a certain uh, proportion of seats will be given to women. Perhaps if um, the women can come together and uh, sponsor a constitutional amendment bill, uh, we'll begin to look at it. The deadly Ebola virus also dominated talks at the assembly meeting. First of all, there is a strong message that has to go out uh, saying that there is the political will to fight Ebola. The authorities at the highest levels of the world, include, uh, including parliamentarians, because at the end of the day, they're the people who make the difference. They represent the people. It is their brothers and sisters that are dying uh, as a result of Ebola. So they have a stake in this. I've said that uh, we want to see a strong message coming out that, that we need a strong legislative framework in each country to contain Ebola. The parliaments should be able to open the, pers uh, the purses of uh, government to make sure that more resources go into fighting this scourge because if it's not contained, it's going to spread like wildfire and uh, other uh, societies will be suffering. So I see the role of parliaments at the level of uh, legislation, at the level of allocation of resources, but also uh, at the level of educating 
the citizens because a lot of the crisis has to do with the mentality and the attitude of the citizens. Some of them do uh, engage in practices that are not conducive to the resolution of the crisis. So as representatives of the people, they have that uh, role of advocacy and uh, sensitization that has to be promoted. The Ebola outbreak has exposed the vulnerability and fragility of healthcare systems across the world. Parliamentarians also debated how to jointly tackle Ebola, which they say is an international emergency, but they warned that restricting the movement of persons across countries is not the solution. Mr. President, Malawi also supports the UN in particular, World Health Organization, in its recommendation not to restrict travel or trade except in the cases where individuals are being confirmed or are, suspend, are suspected of being infected with Ebola virus disease. Speaker said, I therefore call for the big brothers in the world, the so-called big brothers, other than going to war and fire guns all over, let's go to war with Ebola and funding should be directed to such countries, to such nations that require it urgently. Please, let's withdraw all the funds that are going to war and come to war with Ebola because you don't know who the next victim will be. To make available the trial drugs which have been used in the United States and some countries in Europe, and indeed there are some victims who have been cured, we want to see that drug brought to Africa and used in Africa where the problem is. The World Health Organization recently certified Nigeria as being Ebola free. But the Nigerian delegation to the Interparliamentary Assembly say Nigeria is not prepared to take this for granted. Mr. President, the Ebola epidemic cannot be shelved away. Even though contained within a very short time in our country, Ebola was brought to Nigeria in June 2014 by a Liberian, late Patrick Sawyer. The Nigerian government contained the spread within, uh, with minimum casualties. But we are still on our toes and ready to work with international agencies and countries to control the Ebola epidemic. In addition to the strategies which parliamentarians put forward to tackling Ebola, such as increasing awareness of the disease, they have also advocated the setting up of an international fund for the rapid development of a vaccine for Ebola. I am intelligent. I'm incisive. I am passionate. I am focused. I am diplomatic. I'm creative. I am people oriented. I am logical. I am detailed. I am determined. I am inquisitive. I am trained. You're welcome back to the gravel. Now, in the last report, we saw IPU member countries revisiting the issue of ending violence against women. Now, violence could be sexual, domestic, or any harmful practices against women and even children, as if to clearly show that the issue of gender-based violence is a huge problem in Nigeria and should be treated seriously by government, the parliament, and Nigerians. We got a glimpse of what some women and even children have to contend with in the hands of predators. A coalition of civil society organizations held a mock trial in the National Assembly on sexual and gender-based violence. We shouldn't be in denial. Incest is on the increase. Defilement of children is on the increase. And we need to deal with it as a society. We need to come up and say this is debasing our society. And we have a moral uh, high grounds. We have to say no. We call ourselves Africans. We are proud of our culture. But we also have to not be proud of a culture of silence. We have to speak about this thing. You know, a culture shrouded in secrecy when it comes to any sexuality discussion. Chilling. And unfortunately, very true words by the founding director, Women Aid Collective, Joy Zilu. Mrs. Ezilu and other activists are at the National Assembly to lobby for the passage of bills aimed at ending sexual and gender-based violence in Nigeria. And here at this meeting, people who have experienced or have been affected by sexual and gender-based violence 
told your stories to channels television. A father speaks about the rape of his nine-year-old daughter. On August 7th, being Friday this year, it, it, uh, 2014, an other boy is a quickie. Close up where I live. Bring my daughter to death. A girl of nine years. You are being primary for this very this very, this very time. It tarnished our life, it terminated our future. Then as the boy made confidential statement at the police, he said he said he raped the girl. Then he has the girl to stand up, said the girl say he cannot be able to stand up, say he's tired, he's weak. Then that will make him to to terminate our life so that we will not prove him. And later we still discover and if he know because the girl would not send her to anywhere. That's how it comes. Then with the help of Waku, they assisted me. We deposited our cops at Parkland Hospital that very day, yeah, till August 23rd, from the village. Now they are phoning me, where, is, where are we now? How far? When are we bringing the cops to the village? And not that I have anything in me financially, I'm not financially buoyant. Then they were called, they assist me financially. Then I went and paid the hospital bill. The lady, they want to give me again, I will look for the motor. I even abandoned my job because I'm unconscious. I cannot concentrate in doing any other thing again. I tell my people, I did not derive 